So Die Hard is a thing. I'm ashamed to say that it took me entirely too long to get around to this movie. You can blame my friends for that because they never introduced this one to me. Like, I know it has swearing and violence and boobies in it, but like, come on. Die Hard is an exceptional story, largely due to how vulnerable and deep its male protagonist is while still delivering an awesome action movie spectacle. It's a shame that its sequels largely miss the point of what makes this movie so great. For a long time, I never understood why everyone was always going off about Die Hard all the time. To me, it just seemed like a big action set piece movie like any other, but after watching it, I became one of those Die Hard junkies. Is it the greatest movie of all time? No, of course not. But it's definitely a contender for greatest action movie of all time. When other action movies were presenting over-the-top, unrealistic, masculine characters and gratuitous set pieces with hilariously delivered one-liners, Die Hard had a really empathetic lead who was improvising his way out of overwhelming odds, and instead of the cheesy villain, we had a clever, well-spoken conspirator. The set pieces were still impressive, but the single location of the plaza means that exterior shots feel huge without needing to jump the shark. And we still got those one-liners for good measure, but they're delivered out of a need to project confidence rather than just a cool line for audiences to gawk at. I mean, they were still kind of cheesy, but in the best way. No fucking shit, lady! Do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? Also, Bruce Willis with hair is weird. All this is to say that I love Die Hard, even if I don't think it's the best movie ever. But there is a burning question about Die Hard that must be answered. An age-old question that has put message boards and deeper cesspools of the internet into turmoil for as long as the dreaded web has even been a thing, and that is, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Well, seeing as how I posted this at Christmas time, it must be a Christmas movie. But I'm not stupid. I know when people watch Die Hard, and I know that it makes sense to talk about it at Decemberween times, but here's the thing. I don't think that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Shit! Now hold on. Before you go, I have a reason for thinking this, and I want to talk you through the process because I think it's pretty smart. Die Hard is not a Christmas movie because of its setting, story, music, marketing, and because of a little something called Death of the Author. So yes, I think that this is one of the best action movies of all time, but I just feel like there are other factors at play that outshine and downright undercut the assertion that this is a Christmas movie. And I'm going to use philosophy and criticism to prove it. And so today, I want to talk about Die Hard. Die Hard is a movie adaptation of the book Nothing Lasts Forever, which is itself a sequel to The Detective, both of which were written by retired police officer and author Roderick Thorpe. Screenwriter Jeb Stewart had six weeks between jobs and so spoke with some executives at Fox. Fox had previously made an adaptation of The Detective and were interested in Nothing Lasts Forever. They gave Stewart free reign over the story as long as he kept the Christmas time setting. Stewart kept most of the bigger story beats and set pieces, but he changed almost every character either by name or personality. This was because the source material was exceedingly dark and nihilistic, and does not have a happy ending, and the Fox executives wanted something different from the usual gritty action movie. Stewart delivered the screenplay and Fox greenlit the movie the next day, mostly because they needed an action movie for a summer blockbuster. During filming, director John McTiernan worked with the screenwriter Steven D'Souza to rewrite parts of the script in order to flesh out some side characters, but especially Hans Gruber, who was made much more clever and became a thief rather than a terrorist. Bruce Willis's casting in the movie was controversial at the time, as he was mostly known for television, but other big-name action stars kept turning the film down and so he was selected. This was seen as risky, and rumor has it that Willis was purposefully kept out of some marketing materials for fear it would tarnish the film's reputation. When the film first came out, it was not particularly well-liked by critics. Although John McTiernan's direction was praised and Alan Rickman was lauded for his standout performance, Rest in peace, you beautiful man. The movie was overall criticized for its darker tone and heavy use of swearing. The box office proved that Die Hard was a hit with audiences, and it was even nominated for a few awards as well. And of course, it has solidified itself as the quintessential action movie, and people continue to watch it as a Christmas special. Those poor misguided fools. Here's your spoiler warning for Die Hard, but really, even if you haven't seen this movie, it's so culturally relevant, you're probably familiar with every story beat anyway. Here we go. Hey, motherfucker. New York police officer John McLean lands in Los Angeles to try and reconnect with his estranged wife Holly after she took a job on the East Coast and took the kids with her. During a holiday work party celebrating a deal closure, John meets with Holly and the two clearly miss each other but wind up arguing. The party is interrupted by the arrival of a group of highly armed thieves, led by the enigmatic Hans Gruber, who attempt to gain access into the company vault. Barefoot and bruised, John manages to evade the initial sweep of the building and one by one begins picking off the would-be thieves. Narrowly avoiding danger around every corner, John does everything he can to communicate with the outside world and call for help. 
With his crew slowly dwindling, Hans doesn't seem too perturbed by John as his plan continues to go forward. John manages to communicate with a uniformed officer named Al Powell. The two form a bond as they relay information to one another, and Al reveals that he took a desk job after mistakenly shooting a child and is now afraid to draw his gun again. John and Hans continue to play a mental game of trying to learn more information about the other person. When Hans finally figures out that Holly Gennaro is in fact Holly McLean, he forces John's hand, who comes out to confront Hans and his remaining men, but fakes them out by taping a gun to his back, which he uses to get the drop on Hans. After being shot, Hans dangles out of the window, grappling onto Holly for his life, but John comes to the rescue and Hans falls to his death. Outside the building, a tired and injured John exits with Holly. The last of the thieves also appears and starts shooting at the crowd that's gathered, but Officer Powell draws his gun and fires, saving everyone present. Holly and John then drive off, having realized what is truly important to each other. And that's the end, because there are no sequels worth watching. Before I go any further into my arguments about Die Hard, I do just want to sing the praises of this movie. The setup is spectacular. The first scene of John on screen shows him vulnerable, not as a badass, which sets him apart from other action movie heroes who are always presented as badasses or hardasses or rebels. The scene also sets up why John will be barefoot later on. After you get where you're going, take off your shoes and your socks, then you walk around on the rug barefoot and make fists with your toes. Immediately following this, we learn that John has been a cop for 11 years. On the ride in the limo with Argyle, we get a lightning round of John's backstory, but it's not just the answers he gives, but also the way he gives the answers that convey a lot about his character. He tries to come across as a hard ass, but this is used to shield a softer interior. He cares for his wife and is probably quite hurt that she left. The fact that he has a bear with him as a gift is a great visual indicator of this softness. The entire time this takes place, John is on his way to the Nakatomi Plaza, which we can see in the distance and introduces us to the main setting. By the time we get to the plaza, we have pretty much all the information we need about John. Everything that follows has been expertly set up by this point. Even the fact that John smokes becomes important later on in the movie. And I could go further into the movie, but you don't need me to tell you why Die Hard is great. You need me to tell you why Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. I hear you screaming at your screen that Die Hard takes place at Christmas. Well, I don't actually hear you, that would be weird. But I understand that Die Hard takes place at Christmas, and that setting is incredibly important and an often undervalued storytelling element, so let me break this down. The fact that Die Hard takes place at Christmas time does not make it a Christmas movie. There are plenty of horror movies that take place on and around Christmas time, but because they're horror movies, they are out and out not Christmas movies. For Die Hard, the setting of Christmas time is mostly incidental. For the purposes of story, the only thing that Christmas time gives us is an excuse for John to have some vacation time and be in Los Angeles, which is important, but could easily have happened any other time of the year. Secondly, the Christmas party at the Nakatomi Plaza. But, Ellis even admits that this party is a double celebration as they just closed a big deal, meaning that the party could have happened anyway as a congratulatory revel for those who had worked incredibly hard. So again, Christmas is incidental. I will add that the fact that they're in Los Angeles doesn't affect my opinion on this. You don't need snow to celebrate Decemberween, because it's more about the feeling and the holiday spirit that's supposed to happen when you're with the people you love. Which brings us to the story. Is this a movie about a man who's trying to connect with his family? Yes. I would agree that generally this is a pretty Christmassy theme, but that theme doesn't really carry through at the film very well. Early in the movie, when John and Holly argue, we hear them say that they had a similar argument in July, meaning that John could have been in Los Angeles in July of that year. The robbery on the Nakatomi Corporation has nothing to do with Christmas apart from the fact that the thieves knew a party was going to be happening. They're just after the money. They aren't trying to steal Christmas or stop Santa Claus. They aren't even terrorists, as Hans just uses that to get the FBI to play into his hand. They're just thieves who want money, and they chose a day with a party in order to get at Takagi. But John trying to save Holly and get back to his family is all about reuniting at Christmas. Yes, but the movie isn't really about John getting home for Christmas. It's actually more about his marriage and domestic issues with Holly. Sure, this is family adjacent, but it isn't really about Christmas. And lastly, if John was trying to get home for Christmas by killing all the thieves, does that mean that John wouldn't have done any of that stuff if it wasn't Christmas? John stops Hans and his groupies because he's a cop and it's the right thing to do, even if he's outside of his jurisdiction. It goes without saying that he wants to see his wife again, and he does give us a great character moment when he admits he might be wrong to Al on the walkie, but the theme here is one cop against overwhelming odds doing the right thing in order to bring things back to normal. I mean, based on the story beats, I would argue that Die Hard resembles a retelling of the Odyssey or Dante's Inferno more than it does a Christmas movie. 
Next, I want to go over the music. Earlier, I mentioned horror movies, and some of them take place at Christmas and use Christmas songs in order to subvert the Christmas feeling and put their audience on edge. But that means that the inclusion of Christmas songs does not make a good argument as to why this is a Christmas movie. Now, you might argue that there are some really classic Christmas tunes in there. Christmas and Hollis by Run DMC is considered a great piece of Christmas music, but it's only due to people's association with Die Hard as a Christmas movie that this song even became a classic in the first place. So to say that this is a classic piece of Christmas music and that's what makes Die Hard a Christmas movie is just not true. Well, what about the inclusion of Ode to Joy? During any of the scenes with the vault, Ode to Joy is played, first in this kind of sinister version on the cello, which is really inspired because when the vault opens, we get this much more bombastic version. Ode to Joy is not a Christmas song though. Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, Opus 125, fourth movement or finale, is about the brotherhood of humanity in musical form. So although its inspiration is thematically linked to that of Christmas, it's not inherently a Christmas song. McTiernan was inspired to use this piece of music because of A Clockwork Orange and not because of its Christmas ties anyway. So although this is an inspired bit of musicality, it's not a Christmas song. Lastly comes the marketing. Die Hard was released in July of 1988. It was a successful summer blockbuster, and the fact that the movie takes place at Christmas was not really that important. There was no reason to associate this movie with Christmas because it's not really about Christmas, so it was released in summer. The reason people may associate it with Christmas is because it is set at Christmas time, but also because of how films are often handled by television networks. You may be familiar with the movie It's a Wonderful Life and how that movie became so popular. It's because in the 1970s, someone forgot to fill out some copyright paperwork on the movie, meaning that networks didn't have to pay royalties to screen the movie on television. And so every network scrambled to play that movie on repeat to fill airwaves because it was set at Christmas and it made cheap festive time filler. And then slowly, through a constant barrage of exposure, the film became a classic. Because of the Christmas setting, the networks might play Die Hard at Decemberween times, and then the correlation becomes normalized so the movie becomes associated with Christmas without actually being about Christmas. So, now that I have you seething over all my arguments, I want to look at another piece of evidence. There's an interview and video online that you can check out where McTiernan himself says that Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. This would seem to be inescapable proof that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, except for something called Death of the Author. Posited by critic and philosopher Roland Barthes, death of the author is the idea that art or text cannot be confined to the meaning ascribed to it by the author, and to do so would limit that art to interpretive tyranny. Oh, that's a fun one to say. Interpretive tyranny. Based on this idea, anything McTiernan says about Die Hard doesn't affect the text itself and should be ignored. So it doesn't matter what the author says. Die Hard is still not a Christmas movie. But what this also means is that if you disagree with any of my points, you can just tell me to fuck right off. So you take this under advisement, jerkweed. All pretenses aside, I don't actually care if Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not, and it's not even the point I really want to make. What Death of the Author means for art, and particularly in literature, is that to an extent, nothing the author thinks about the text matters. Once the art leaves their hands, it is no longer theirs, but something that exists as an interaction between art and audience, or art and observer in an individual case. That means when your English teacher tries to explain that blue curtains have meaning, they're basically just making shit up because of the experience they've had as an individual reader and a member of a wider culture that may perpetuate this idea. It would be just as valid for you to argue that the curtains being blue is meaningless, or in my case, that Die Hard isn't a Christmas movie. That doesn't mean you can just make stuff up about the text. If you want your ideas to be taken seriously, then you need to argue them and then back those arguments up with examples from the text. When English teachers try to get you to pick out themes or meanings in books or art, it's because they're trying to show you the skill of how to argue and find meaning in text, because it's something that you have to practice if you want to get good at. But scrutinizing authorial intention in a piece of art is basically impossible. There's no way of knowing what any author was truly thinking. And any English teacher worth their salt would be glad to see you present an argument that is contrary to their own, provided that you can argue it well based on your interpretation of textual examples. Any idea about themes or meaning or intention is a valid interpretation, but the quality of that interpretation is measured by your ability to articulate it. So I gave the example of Die Hard not being a Christmas movie, and then attempted to argue why my points are valid with examples. I think I did a pretty good job, but the truth is I don't really care if Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. It's a damn good movie and probably the action movie that all other action movies wish that they could be. It doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks about Die Hard as long as you can argue your point of view using setting, story, Story, music, marketing, or more as examples, because then you'll have a great argument that people can listen to, or not.
And that is why I think Die Hard may or may not be a Christmas movie, but why you should come up with your own opinions and arguments on that, and why that's totally fine with me. Happy December, Ween. Here are my stray thoughts. I really do enjoy how much more realistically vulnerable John is as an action hero, and that's arguably what makes him the best action hero. The fact that this movie takes place in a singular building makes the action scenes claustrophobic so that smaller events have way more impact. Things like glass on the floor are a game changer for characters in this movie. The entire game of mental chess between Hans and John is wickedly sharp and makes it that much smarter than just your average action movie. Maybe I should do another episode arguing why Die Hard is actually the greatest action movie ever. Oh, I could easily argue that. Hey! Thanks so much for watching that video. If you want to hear about more of my thoughts on Death of the Author and why there's no such thing as bad art, check out this video on High School Musical that I did. Be sure to check out our other channel, The Cinecastrus, for more conversations about movies. Click that like button like you're trying to explode a detonator on a building full of terrorists. And stick around for more awesome episodes of This Is A Thing, the long and the short of it, and whatever else we got coming up right here on Cinemasters Ultimate Timeline.